Hi, welcome back to the Javits Center. We're live at the Nest Summit. And my guest today is Valentina Germani, Legal Officer, UN Division of Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea. Thank you so much, Valentina, for joining us today. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks a lot for the opportunity to uh, be here today and participate uh, in the NEST Summit and uh, for being here to talk to you about ocean and climate, a subject I'm very passionate about. So let's start off digging into the topic a little bit. We obviously know that we hear regularly the oceans are warming, and that's a big part of climate change. But can you go a little bit deeper into the interaction between oceans and climate risk? Absolutely. First of all, let me uh, remember or remind everyone that uh, ocean covers 71 percent of the uh, surface of uh, our planet. And they support many unique habitats, ecosystems, and importantly, they also offer uh, a large number of direct and indirect services to us humans. Uh, think about fisheries, oil and gas production, other minerals, 90 uh, percent uh, of global trade goes through the ocean, uh, and uh, 50 percent of the we breathe also comes from the ocean. The oceans are also linked, you already mentioned, to the climate system and uh, they exchange in particular both water, energy and carbon. Um, we know a lot more than in the past about all these exchanges thanks to the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, or IPCC in short reports in uh, uh, recent year and I would really invite anyone who wants to know a lot more about this to read those, uh, those reports, especially the one that was issued last year on uh, ocean and uh, cryosphere in a changing climate. Um, an important takeaway from these uh, reports is that significant changes have already taken place in the oceans due to uh, climate change. And these changes are really expected to persist for century or even millennia. The main drivers of uh, ocean change, you already mentioned one, ocean warming, but also uh, ocean acidification is uh, a, a driver of change that is related to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we know that the global uh, uh, temperature has already risen by one uh, uh, degree centigrade uh, compared to pre-industrial uh, levels. And the 90%, even more than 90% of that additional heat or energy has in fact ended up in the ocean. Uh, in particular, this calculation was made between uh, 1971 and 2010. Uh, the increase in the water temperature causes a process called uh, thermal expansion, which means that the same amount of water, when it heats up, it occupies more uh, volume. And this process, together with the enormous amount of uh, water that is uh, uh, ending up in the oceans as it melts from ice, ice sheets and glacier, also due to uh, global warming, in fact, is uh, causing uh, the global mean sea level, sea level rise to uh, <coughs> to raise. Uh, in, in fact, we know from uh, again the IPCC that since the mid 1800s, uh, uh, sea level rise has been uh, greater than the average rate for the previous two millennia, and uh, it's really expected to continue to raise uh, well beyond uh, 2,100. So it's a process that is here to stay. Of course, the rate will depend on the uh, uh, future emission pathway that uh, uh, we will uh, that we will see just to give you an, uh, uh, some some figures or to to get uh, a better practical understanding around 1993 sea level rise was uh, rising uh, uh, at a rate of about 3.2 millimeters per year we are now at five approximately five millimeters uh, per year uh, this is the sort of steady ongoing uh, uh, sea level rise but uh, uh, this also contributes to a higher extreme uh, sea level uh, uh, rises and, and events, for example, when uh, uh, storm surges occurs. And these uh, extreme sea level events are also expected to become more and more common uh, uh, in, the, in the years and centuries to, to come. Valentina? Yes. Um, I, I'm just curious because one of the things that I think people are unaware of is that when we think about sea level rise, I think people think about a glass of water or a bowl of water, and they think if water is rising, it's rising. But what I've been reading of late is that actually the water isn't rising at the same level in the same areas, that actually certain areas we're seeing higher sea level rise. Can you at least explain a little bit about that process and how it works? And then I must imagine that if that's true, that coastal communities or islands like the Fiji Islands or Pagao are being affected 
much more than we might be experiencing currently in the United States. Absolutely. The, it's very important point that you're making, Jeff. Uh, uh, the, the rise of sea level is not uh, uh, geographically uniform and it's very much dependent on uh, regional uh, differences, the shape and the uh, configuration of the, of the coastline, uh, for example, but also other processes that are taking place uh, uh, along the coast. Uh, there are areas where uh, uh, human activities have already uh, uh, caused coastal erosion and, and other uh, uh, changes to the coastline. And in those areas, the effect of sea level rise is much more felt than in, uh, in other uh, regions. I think the uh, the difference in different regions could be uh, more or less around 30 percent difference in the uh, experience uh, uh, on, on how this coastline experienced sea level rise. And based on what you said, does it also matter the temperature in the local area? Because if the warming is actually creating the expansion of the water, then is it rising more around the equator than it might be rising around the Arctic Circle, for instance? Um, Yes and no, in the sense that, yes, temperatures are raising uh, uh, in, in the equators and in some regions a lot more. But for example, in very cold regions like the polar areas, we have the other, uh, uh, the other impact of climate change, which is mentioned is the melting of uh, glaciers and the uh, ice. So even though in that area, in those areas, the sea level does not so much rise because of the ocean warming, it's definitely rising at very high rate because of the melting of the ice. So Arctic communities are just are experiencing uh, sea level rise uh, consequences just as much or, you know, I don't know if it's as much, but uh, uh, also um, as uh, uh, small island developing states and low-lying coasts and delta areas that are experiencing in uh, tropical countries. So it's, uh, it's not just dependent <clears throat> on the temperature. So we have a confluence of events. We have warming, which is creating rising. We have glacier melts, which is creating rising. We have acidification. What does that interaction do to coastal communities that depend on fishing and coral reefs to be thriving? Can you talk a little bit about the effects that we're already seeing today? Because I think the other issue is that a lot of people think this is a future problem. Um, and there are coastal communities and islands that I believe today are, are seeing significant catastrophe already. Can you talk to that? Absolutely, absolutely. The, the, not only the ecological, uh, but also the socioeconomic uh, consequences are already being felt in, uh, in many states. I already mentioned the small island uh, developing states, uh, but all low-line uh, coastlines and deltas and our communities, they are currently experiencing uh, uh, the impacts of uh, sea level rise, but also ocean warming, ocean uh, acidification. Uh, in terms of uh, warming and uh, acidification, um, these two processes uh, uh, are uh, determining the decline or even the regional shift of many uh, fish stocks, uh, but also coral bleaching and other uh, ecosystem degradation. And uh, of course, this has uh, a great impact on food security and the livelihoods uh, and in general sustainable development of the coastal communities that rely on these resources. Uh, uh, for their uh, protein intake and uh, economic uh, activities. Uh, least developed countries and uh, small island developing states are uh, mostly affected, but let's not remember that many developed states also rely on fishing, aquaculture, seafood production as an important uh, economic activity in some of the coastal regions, and they are also uh, feeling the, uh, the its, uh, uh, impacts. Uh, as you were uh, mentioning, uh, uh, sea level rise is perhaps uh, the source of the greatest impact to coastal communities, uh, including due to loss of life, uh, the displacement of uh, communities, loss of territories, uh, destruction of property, destruction of uh, infrastructure. And these effects have both already been uh, observed with many states uh, uh, reporting uh, uh, patterns of uh, irreversible coastal erosion, chronic uh, flooding, uh, but also are projected to, of course, uh, increase as the uh, decades and, and, uh, and more will, uh, will pass. Uh, so, for example, it is uh, uh, projected that uh, some areas will be permanently submerged 
And this will, of course, cause the uh, loss of inhabitable land, so have the social uh, impact that uh, go along with that, but also <clears throat> the loss of uh, maritime uh, territories and domains, which are calculated from the coastline. So as coastlines uh, recedes, also maritime domains of many states will uh, will see possibly uh, some changes. Uh, more frequent flooding, more extreme uh, coastal erosion, uh, will uh, will be uh, uh, taking place, but also the, an important impact will be uh, the salinization of agricultural uh, lands and of uh, freshwater reservoirs with the salty water from the oceans uh, in, uh, filtering through those uh, those systems. And of course, uh, uh, as a consequence, the coastal communities will uh, uh, will see uh, impacts related to their uh, livelihood their food security, water security, um, but also human health and human security will be at stake with the uh, uh, possible uh, uh, significant displacement of people and, uh, and loss of life. And also communicable diseases uh, uh, born through uh, water also might see an, an increase. So you will understand that, you understand that there will be possibly very, uh, um, very great consequences from a, a social perspective. From, uh, from a cultural perspective, let's not uh, also uh, forget to mention that uh, the inundation of uh, lands will also uh, affect cultural system, the ways of life of uh, many communities, uh, for example, because of the loss, loss of uh, cultural heritage uh, and also the loss of uh, spiritual sites. And of course, uh, last but definitely not least, uh, impacts on uh, a number of economic sectors that rely, for example, of uh, uh, coastal uh, transportation with many airports and seaports, of course, uh, uh, located along uh, the coast, which will be impacted by uh, flooding and coastal erosion. Um, but also uh, those, uh, uh, those uh, economic factors that rely on coastal areas, for example, uh, tourism and uh, the recreational industries mm -hmm. will be obviously uh, affected. Val Valentina, can you tell us a little bit about what the UN is doing, especially around the United States? Are we seeing any progress in these areas? Um, with all these uh, impacts and effect and, uh, and uh, increased understanding through the uh, scientific data that has become available and also the, the observed impact acro across uh, so societies and countries, of course, the UN system is also uh, um, a these, uh, these various impacts, both within the different uh, uh, agencies uh, that, uh, uh, that are mandated to deal with specific sectors, for example, fisheries and international shipping, etc. But also the UN is, uh, is now trying to focus on uh, uh, ensuring that there is some coherence and coordination uh, with a view to have a more uh, integrated and coherent uh, responses to uh, to the impact that I just uh, described. Uh, he, if we look at uh, here in New York, uh, uh, the UN General Assembly, which is one of the bodies that uh, the division I work for uh, is, uh, is servicing and, and assists. Um, the UN, if you, UNGA, if you allow me to use the short version, is a global body with the representation of all 193 member states. And uh, on a yearly basis, it undertakes a, a sort of comprehensive and cross-sectoral uh, overview of oceans, affairs, and the law of the sea. And it's playing a very important role in trying to ensure this coordination uh, uh, amongst the various UN uh, responses. Uh, since 2006, so quite a few years ago already, the GA has uh, addressed in its annual resolution the impacts of uh, ocean acidification on the oceans, particularly by promoting and, and uh, encouraging states to uh, enhance scientific activity and also uh, address these impacts through the uh, relevant agencies and institutions. Um, the, the, the GA also acts uh, uh, through a number of uh, subsidiary bodies and uh, maybe one that I want to mention here, there's many of them, but the one that is important and that we also support in our uh, division is the regular process for uh, global reporting and assessment of the state of the marine environment, including socioeconomic aspects. <laughs> like very long names of the UN. The longer the name, the more effective it is. <laughs> uh, hopefully. <laughs> 
uh, I mentioned this body not just because we, uh, uh, our division uh, supports it, but because it's also uh, an important uh, effort aimed at uh, enhancing the scientific basis for uh, policy making on the ocean front, a little bit like the IPCC does in the climate uh, uh, arena. And of course, it has considered uh, uh, questions of climate change. And uh, currently, this, uh, uh, this process is uh, working on the second uh, ocean assessment, uh, which uh, will be uh, become available uh, probably next next year. But there are many other uh, bodies related to the General Assembly that are looking at various aspects of the uh, ocean and climate interactions of course there are the uh, uh, the efforts and uh, uh, in the context of the SDGs uh, and in particular the UN conference to support the implementation of uh, SDG 14 uh, in 2017 and then uh, to resume this year, but uh, maybe next year, if COVID uh, allows, uh, we'll also look at important uh, aspects of how these uh, uh, impacts of climate change on oceans will affect sustainable uh, uh, development pathway. Valentina, um, I just want to thank Valentina Germani so much for joining us from the UN. It was a pleasure, and there is obviously so much to learn about the interaction of oceans and the climate, but we really appreciate at least delving into the subject today. Thank you for joining me at the Nest Summit live at the Javits Center. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much.